all right. Okay, let's go ahead and look at chapter 11. Maybe we're a little ahead. I don't think we're behind. We're not behind. All right. So here we are just looking at the percentage of primary energy. And you remember back from chapter one and two what primary energy, it's energy that is coming directly from Mother Nature. Uh, that goes into our secondary and tertiary energy. So France, as I mentioned, is sort of near the top of the list. Slovakia, Belgium, Switzerland, etc. You know, and, and you know, for this, we can also appreciate the fact that nuclear energy density, nu nuclear energy, it's very dense. You know, it does not take very much uranium to make a whole bunch of heat and therefore a whole bunch of electricity. So, uh, as you see, a lot of these these um, uh, countries, they don't have the, uh, the natural resources, they're not going to throw up a bunch of wind turbines, they're not uh, um, you know, going to start fracking or whatever in the, in the vineyards of, of France, so there they are with their um, nuclear. I think, it, I think at this point China is probably uh, a greater fraction that we're seeing there, uh, with Germany really going gangbusters on renewable, that number has likely diminished. When Fukushima hit, that number was zero. I mean, it, so the, these numbers, you can sort of think of them, it's just, this is one <coughs> little snapshot in time, but these aren't, these aren't set in stone, but that's just kind of the, the relative, uh, relative values. I think India is getting into solar pretty hard. I think India is getting into a little bit of everything, yeah. uh, trying, to, trying to electrify their, their subcontinent. Um. Okay. So this is the this is sort of the, the evolution, if you will, of nuclear power. So early prototype reactors, you know, not not very efficient. Uh, you can see that almost all of them are near some body of water. They have they have to stay cool. They have to have some way to uh, uh, get rid of that uh, that waste heat because you know it, when it comes down to it, all of these reactors just like the coal-fired power plants that we read about in our, in our previous summary, they all rely on that uh, Carnot efficiency. They, you know, they have, something has to get, there has to be something hot somewhere, something cold somewhere else, where else. Water has 1,000 times the cooling capacity of air. So there you go, you're right there on the, in the, you know, in the same way that, do you want to be thrown outside into 32 degree air, or do you want to be dunked in the river at 32 degree water? Take your pick. So, <laughs> the the you know the the heat capacity, uh, you know, to both you know absor to absorb water is for, on a on a per mass base or sorry on a per volume basis uh, is a thousand times greater for <coughs> water than air. So that's where you where you see these guys. Sometimes you'll see the big uh, well you you'll always see these big cooling towers, and so if you don't if you don't have um, uh, direct access to water, you still need to um, pump that, that hot water through something that's got a lot of surface area. And you can just think of those things as, as your, your sweat glands, you know, to keep your own body cool on a, on a hot day. All right, so I don't know if you remember back, gosh, I think it was the, um, it was, the was it McCain, the senator from the Southwest? They were, you know, they were kind of, they, when he was running for president, there was a you know, the, the energy debate was kind of first and foremost. You didn't hear about it that much. You get the little, the little sound bites from Trump versus Clinton, but uh, for whatever reason, the McCain campaign talked about this a lot. So need for low carbon electricity supplies. So I think we've all you know realized the uh, detrimental effects of, of unbridled greenhouse gas flow into the atmosphere. So that's that's this little circle circle right here. Um, national energy security, so, you know, you know a, good, a good analogy there. And, and again, with a lot of these uh, military leaders, you know, for whatever it's worth, I mean, this is one of the first times, you know, that I can remember in history, they didn't only really have like a military person running for president, you know, somebody like deeply involved with the military, at least, at least that I know of, and I'm sure 
Last Hillary's been in. What's that? Last one was Dwight. Yeah. Was now. Yeah. So you know, I'm sure Hillary's been in the Situation Room plenty. But the point is, um, you know, the national energy security there, you know what happened in the 70s with OPEC and the price fixing, et cetera, et cetera, and then, you know, invading Kuwait and invading Iraq. I mean, that's your, that's your, um, that's this little part of the equation would say, hey, let's just, uh, let's go nuclear. We even saw that Switzerland was, was uh, nuclear for these two reasons. Well, um, fossil fuels are still relatively um, inexpensive. Uh, high capital cost, building a nuclear power plant is not a walk in the park, uh, especially with you know, the, the failures that we've seen Competitive electricity markets, and I, I think what we're going to see, you know, now uh, coming online when, when these larger wind installations get built, the spot market for electricity is going to be extremely volatile because if the wind is just blowing like stink and I'm making it all day long, the, that price goes down very quickly because you don't, you can almost give it away, and say, hey, I, you know, I've got all these, you know, these cheap electrons flying out of my wind plant. Uh, what about you, nuclear? What about you, coal? Aren't you kind of like locked into whatever your operating cost is? So um, safety, we just mentioned nuclear pr proliferation. And again, I don't get into all, the, all of the details, but we did see in, in Chapter 10, one of the byproducts from um, nuclear fission. And let me, let me dive into that one more time. Doesn't uranium break down plutonium? Well, it's just, it, it, is, it is a pathway. Okay. It is a pathway. Um, so if we go back down, I, I mentioned that uranium, uranium-235. Uh, so, you know, in pure, in pure, Fission, uranium is going to break down into lighter elements. Plutonium is a heavier element, but as, as we know, with the neutrons that fly off of uranium, depending on your, your concentration, you could sit there and just manufacture plutonium. There's really no, no shortage of those neutrons flying off of there. And so that's a, you know, a breeder reactor. There's several at the Savannah River site there in, in Georgia. Um, and again, plutonium could be used for weapons. It's also, um, uh, uh, you know, very high energy density, and so it's good uh, for spacecraft and for nuclear submarines. So it's another um, use. Dealing with nuclear waste, I mean, once once the majority of the radio radioactivity is gone, there's still some there. We did, we did the half-life experiments uh, equations last time. It you know it's got to go somewhere, and then the uncertain future of uranium supplies. You know, we, it's underground, probably not the most pleasant thing to go digging for. All right. So here's an example um, of a plant. Just dial in. Um, oh, so this is the, this is the size well, uh, the size well B in Suffolk. I'll just read a little bit from the book. It says, the Sizewell B power plant, figure 11.4 that we're looking at, was under construction at the, the time of electricity privatization. What's that mean? What's privatization mean? It means that uh, the, the government no longer fixes the prices. So if, if I can come in as a corporation and say, hey, I can do it quicker. Well, in, in, in any one of these problems, you guys have maybe watched Shark Tank. If I can solve a problem, which is give people electricity and do it cheaper, I'm going to win the the capital, you know, capitalism game. So, less paperwork. Maybe some, yeah, probably a little less red tape than going through the the government. Mm -hmm. uh, but since then, no new reactors have been built in the UK. It doesn't say what year this happened. Nuclear reactors are highly capital intensive. They also have a poor record of being built uh, built to budget. Uh, the cost of the size well B 
increased from 7 billion pounds to 3.7 during construction, so it more than doubled. Capital repayments can represent 70%. So you're not just paying for the electricity, you're actually paying for the capital. Some, you know, somebody, and the, you know, the thing about capitalism is the only way it can be sustained is if more money comes back than went in. 70% um, of the total cost of electricity generated. So they're, they're actually just paying for money. Uh, plants therefore need a long operational lifetime over which this investment is repaid in order to be economic. Whilst in the past power plants could be state funded, no longer so with privatization, the new free market doctrine asked that they should be uh, assessed on the basis of commercial rates of return. The problems of reducing the capital cost of future reactor designs are discussed later in the chapter. So there's your kind of money versus technology thing. All right, here's a shot of uranium oxide. So this is relatively stable. You can just think of it as, as, as uranium rust, just like, you know, iron oxide is, is, is that. And so this is, you know, it's relatively stable. The oxygen is, is sitting there. Um, it can't really be caught on fire because it's kind of already burned. You're not going to shove more oxygen in, in there. And the uranium atoms themselves are far enough apart and in low enough density that they don't start bombarding and, and reacting with each other. So one of, just one of the processes along the way. Okay, so just like we saw with fossil fuel production, the uranium production is um, governed by a lot of different things. You know, we talked about, about the economics, there's some politics, where does the waste go? Here are the, the fuel, um, fuel demand factors. So the, the demand for electricity, unless some like just bizarrely efficient technology comes along. I mean, we know now that LED lights, for example, are more efficient. We can build fridges and dishwashers and all that that are less efficient. But demand is, is going to um, increase. So if production sort of outstrips demand, then the price of nuclear electricity goes down, which, well, is that a good thing or a bad thing? Do, we, do you want, <laughs> you know, so, so that, that's, the, that's the weird balancing act that capitalism is always, if you overproduce, then you're not going to make as much. If you, if you underproduce, you're not going to make as much, right? Because you don't have enough much to sell. If you overproduce, you have too much to sell and, and your, your price goes down. So that's the kind of the neat little double-edged sword of privatization. Okay, so here are the, uh, the mining rates. This is, so this is the, the thousands of tons of uranium mined per year. And, and note, it's, it's a lot small. It's only 10,000 tons. Tiny, you know, compared to, to coal. Um, and then, um, let's just look at the RAR. So reasonable reasonably assured resources. It means that you, you know, you've been down there with your Geiger counter, you've done some seismic, and you're like, okay, there's you know, a reasonable amount of, of um, uranium down there. Inferred resources, those that require further direct measurements before making investment decisions. So here's where your, you know, your geology degrees uh, come, into, come into play. And this is the, the mining cost. So pretty cheap, 40 bucks a ton. Pretty cheap. I mean, that's, that's kind of what coal is, is going for. Um, and then, you know, we've been, we've been looking into some of the wood markets in terms of what's it, what's it cost to get a ton of wood out of the forest. We start getting up into that uh, 130 to over $130 a ton. It, um, well, it's, it's becomes cost prohibitive. All right. So this is figure 11.7. Centrifuges filled with the... Uh, uranium hexafluoride. So again, we're, we're in a uh, chemical environment. So you can think of this as going from a chemical environment to a mechanical one. Inside of each one of these guys, you have um, uh, a centrifuge spinning. Uranium obviously being extraordinarily dense is going to go to the bottom, and that's how you end up with your concentration. That's why you hear the, when, um, what was that guy's, uh, Blix, Hans Blix was over in, Iraq looking for the centrifuges. I mean, this is what he was 
uh, this is what he was looking for. Is that's how you concentrate it, either for reactors or for um, or for bombs. All right. Um, here's Chernobyl, and as I mentioned uh, previously, one of my colleagues back at Drexel. Exam, you know, had the opportunity to examine this site, and the the um, the problem here was was um, you can even look at it as simple as this. This will be my last slide. This will be my last slide. So you, you can look at the um, the reactor as sort of a, a roadway, right? So here you are driving along. In your in your reactor, and what you're trying to do is um, here's cold over here. You're trying to keep the thing from going too cold because if it does, you have to then restart it. It's down. Other energy sources have to come online. So this direction is too cold, you know. And then what's what's over here? Well, here comes the you know the class eight truck. coming at you, you know, 18-wheeler, head-on. Um, this this direction is too hot. So it was after some big Russian holiday. The, the poor guy who was on duty saw the car drifted off the road over here, oversteered, and smashed right in the truck and went too hot. So that's you know, the best analogy I can give as to how the, 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 the bomb went off at, uh, at Chernobyl. So he overcorrected by, you know, pull, pulling out the absorbers, and, and uh, that's pretty much what happened. Okay, so I'll let you get through the rest of um, the rest of the chapter. They talk about safety. They talk about deep storage. Uh, talk a little bit about what the costs are. Talk about next gen. How you might go nanoparticle with this stuff. Um, you know, some other reactors. Here's kind of the, the flow. Uh, through these plants. Um, here's your, your breeder. Oh, here, here's thorium. We talked about that a little bit, how you might go, because there's a lot of naturally occurring thorium on planet Earth, too. Yeah, so um, we're never going to see the, the end of it. And this is um, getting on to fusion, react, you know, fusion versus fission inside the Death Star. Yeah, well, and here you're... It, yeah, and in, in here you're you're confining the reaction because it, it's it's so hot it's going to melt through any material. Plasma. Yes, yeah, plasma. Yeah, this would not be platinum. No, this is just going to be some kind of the, the 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 actual material itself doesn't matter because whatever it is is going to get melted. But the, the point is, you've got your um, fusion reactor sort of happening in a magnetic ring. So there it is, fun stuff. Thanks, Brad. Yeah. See you all Tuesday. Oh.